Hello, hello everyone. Welcome Hi. back to Virtual Book Club. <laughs> we are so glad to be back. I know this is really wonderful, yeah. Sarah, to be back again. We had a good uh, end of summer, but I've got cold weather coming here and I'm glad to be talking about wool. I feel like today I finally felt like I could <laughs> declare it was sweater weather, if that's okay to sort of coin it, but I think it's officially sweater weather in Pennsylvania, if you agree. Well, <laughs> I'm trying to hang on for as long as I possibly can. I'm still wearing shorts. He's standing here in shorts and Birkenstocks right now, folks, so yeah. yeah. He's are you surprised? Yeah, yeah, but... Well, as people join in the conversation, we are thrilled this evening to have a very new, unique experience to the book club that we did back in the fall, which of course was... A wonderful experience. We had such a good time getting together with each of you every yep. Sunday, or excuse me, Wednesday evening to discuss the golden thread. Um, but when we found the book that we chose for this round, which of course is Wool, Unraveling an American Story of Artisans and Innovation, I was thrilled. I felt like it was going to fit perfectly into the format that we had developed back in the springtime. I agree. Yeah. It's just like the next stage of uh, ongoing Wednesday evenings with all of you good folks. Yeah, so. we really, really had a good time. And um, I, I decided after reading the introduction to this book, like, let's try something different. And I reached out to the author. Her name is Peggy Hart. Um, and she was very, very amenable to meeting with us. And tonight we have an interesting opportunity to talk yeah. with her. She's going to share a little bit about the making of her book um, and has prepared a nice little PowerPoint presentation together or for you all to learn a little bit more about the writing of this book. Um, I can see people in are tuning all over from all over the country, really. I think I've seen at least 10 states go by right now. That's so great. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm going to transition over and bring Peggy on board so that she can introduce herself this evening. Um, I would typically start a book talk by doing a survey, which is asking you what you're wearing today. You know, as it's fall, I'm in Massachusetts. Um, as it's fall in New England, it's starting to get cooler and everybody's putting on another layer. So. I'd like to know what your um, insulating layer is, whether it's wool, cotton, or synthetic. And you can add this to the chat. Um, instead of having you raise your hand, as I typically would, um, you can just add it to the chat, and then we will tally it up at the end. And I'm aware that this is a self-selected audience, so yes. many of you may be wearing wool. but. You know, I'm not trying to um, fiber shame you. I'm just. <laughs> no, you'll, it's okay. You'll see it's, it's part of um, what I'm interested in about sure. the book, about sure. consumption. And I'm sure yeah. uh, a lot of that will be influenced by where people are tuning in from as well, because I'm sure the folks in Arizona may not be wearing a lot of wool this evening. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe socks. Maybe <laughs> socks. That's, That's right. We do yeah. have a lot of hand knitters in this in this group as well. Yeah. So make sure you make a comment in the um, the section because we're discussing wool. We're interested to know what you're wearing tonight. How much of you are actually wearing wool this evening? Well, I'll start you off. I'm I'm wearing a cotton shirt, 100% <laughs> cotton. I yeah. love it that way. Mm -hmm. But I'm absolutely with Sarah. Um, it's time to get the sweaters out. And Peggy, mm -hmm. I wonder if your wood stove is going. I was watching uh, Al Roker this morning, and he was saying that you're expected to get a real nor'easter, so you might even be getting snow up there. Is that right? I hope not. Yeah, <laughs> not, that I know. not for you, too. My wood stove is definitely not going, but I am wearing wool. Good Full for you. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Well, yeah. Peggy, I'm going to give the stage over to you because you've put together a nice presentation to share with our, our audience this evening. Um, are you ready to take it? Okay, so I'm just going to start, um, set the stage, so to speak, by reading the first page of the book. The story of wool in the United States is a romantic yarn, a story of love and love lost. It's an epic tale with a cast of millions, farmers, 
farm wives, shepherds, sheep herders, artisans, merchants, immigrants, slaves, Native Americans, inventors, captains of industry, mill workers, advertising and salespeople, department store owners, husbands, and housewives. The backdrop of American history is the set, colonization, slavery, wars, the Industrial Revolution, westward expansion, cultural shifts as brought about by innovations such as central heating and automobiles. The plot follows the sheep, source of the original miracle fiber, as they arrived in the new world and spread from coast to coast. For the first 300 years, wool was grown, processed, consumed, and cherished as one of life's essentials. Then in a sudden plot twist akin to an alien invasion, it met a fearsome foe, man-made fibers, which won the hearts of Americans with new garments like acrylic sweaters, men's polyester double-knit suits, and finally, polar fleece jackets. Wool's fade to near irrelevancy by the end of the 20th century was drastic and unforeseen. As late as 1940, a monograph written about the wool and worsted industry in Rhode Island stated, the importance of wool products in everyday living is obvious, so important that since history has been recorded, they have been taken for granted and always will be. The 1950s proved to be the pivotal point, the beginning of the end for the commercial American wool industry. Post-World War II, man-made fibers became widely available to the textile industry. Weaving technology evolved further and consumers began to make different choices. Dr. Ernest Dichter, president of the Institute for Motivational Research of Consumers, asked in an American Fabrics article in 1958, how does it happen that a centuries old romance between man and textiles has lost so much of its ardor that an earlier intimacy and understanding has given way to cool aloofness? The story of wool traces the arc of production from handcraft to mechanical invention and industrialization returning to handcraft. Though in deindustrialization in the 20th century closed almost all the mills, handcraft would keep the noble fiber alive, a development that's celebrated at the sheep and wool festivals held in many states. Excuse me for just a second, Peggy. That was wonderful. We'd love to hear your voice. Do you have your PowerPoint up on your screen right now? I do. Okay, can you try and reload that because it's not coming up on our screen and you have some really wonderful photos that I want to share with folks. Okay. Let's see what we got. Yeah, why isn't it coming up? I don't know. Do you see your share option there? Oh, that's what I'm not doing. Yeah, I'm sorry. that's okay. I'm uh -oh. sorry to interrupt you, but I just okay. want them to get all of it out of the presentation Great. you gathered. We practiced this. <laughs> it's okay. Okay. That's excellent. Great. Okay. Okay. How's there that? There we are. Thank you so much. Okay. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. So I didn't start out to write a history of wool over four centuries. This, you know, seemed like a hopelessly broad overview and just too much to chew. But, and I shared this with Sarah, who said, well, you know, the last book we read covered 7,000 years, was it? Something like that. <laughs> so anyway, um, I'm a weaver. I weave primarily blankets and I work on Crompton and Knowles looms, which are 1940s vintage um, power looms. They were manufactured in Worcester, Massachusetts by the Crompton and Knowles company. And Crompton and Knowles made virtually all the wool and worsted and wool and worsted looms in this country for over a hundred years. They started in 1837. Um, but I did not start on power looms. So just not to scare the weavers here, um, I started as a hand weaver. I have a couple um, barn frame looms, which I love and I still weave on. But this is what my power looms look like. I don't throw the shuttles as this um, slide might indicate. Um, every so often I have to put a pick in, you know, by hand, so that's what I'm doing here. But uh, there's a motor on the loom, and so the shuttles go back and forth automatically. And um, there's a lot of patterning 
possibilities. I have 24 shafts. What you see on the top left is the patterning mechanism and you see a chain on the left hand side. That's the pattern chain. And that tells the harnesses which harnesses to move when. So it's a Dobby head, if you're familiar with Dobby looms. So um, I'm a weaver. I was thinking about why my loom ceased being manufactured. You know, they're incredible what they can do. I've been weaving on them for almost 40 years, um, but they stopped making them. So I started thinking about that and how that happened. And I started thinking, well, it had something to do with the woolen and worsted industries closing and more broadly, the whole textile industry um, ended in this country. Um, before I get to that, let, let me just show you some pictures of um, historical pictures of Crompton and Knowles. This is the original loom and it was built in 1837. It had a the same sort of patterning device on the left-hand side that is a um, pattern chain, a dobby chain. So it differed a lot from the cotton looms in that it had more shafts or harnesses. Whoops, okay. So I started thinking about you know, bigger and bigger questions. The story snowballed. Um, what happened to the textile industry? How did the development and use of new fibers affect traditional fibers, specifically wool? And the story includes technology, you know, the, um, the looms and the other textile equipment. It involves production, the mills. It involves marketing. Um, and I was left with where to, to start, where to end the story. And I didn't want to end it on like a total bummer, like the textile industry is gone. So I decided to start with the, um, with handcraft as textiles were produced in this country in the 1700s and then move into industrialization and then come back to handcraft. And same with the history of sheep raising. Um, it started at, you know, with small farm flocks and then large herds grazing on the range and then back to mostly small flocks. And I want to, you know, emphasize again that this is the, I'm telling the story as I see it and at the risk of great oversimplification. So realizing I had to channel or focus my thinking, I, I channeled my 11th grade American history teacher who taught us to, to think about it in terms of what is the question I'm trying to answer. And I eventually realized that the story I was telling was a story of consumer choices, what was available at different times and what people chose in response to changing circumstances. And these changing circumstances included changes in demographics, expand, population expansion across the continent, changes in lifestyle, for example, indoor heating, closed cars, washing machines, and the development of man-made fibers. So my question focus became consumption from handcraft to industrialization and back. And I decided to try and track per capita consumption. And for that, I had to guesstimate in the first century but in later, you know, the, the, the latter three centuries, I was able to use census data and statistics on mill consumption. So, um, as I said in the introduction, wool is the original miracle fiber. And um, those of us who work with it love it for its, its insulation properties, for taking colors so beautifully, for being so elastic for being absorbent and, you know, you wool can absorb up to something like 60% of its weight and still remain warm, which is wonderful. Um, it's flame resistant. 
but as I said, it fell, um, uh, it, it was susceptible when, when things changed. And one of the things that changed in the 30s and 40s was that suddenly washing machines were available. And as most of you know, you do have to be really careful with wool if you're washing it in a washing machine. This, this was a, a fantasy photograph from a book called Mother, but I thought it expressed the joy of what washing machines so beautifully. So I compiled as much information as I could about consumption of wool during various time periods in the US. Um, like I say, in the 1700s, um, before census statistics were available, I had to um, guesstimate um, based on triangulation from a number of different sources, and I go into that more in the chapter, um, uh, in the first, first chapter of the book. But it was around three pounds per person in, and then as mill production ramped up, um, by the 1840s, which is the beginning of mill production, you know, you can see it's starting to rise. It's at its highest point in 1890, um, which is the high point of production of, of or manufacture of woolens and horses in the country. But it also, during this period, people had more disposable income and they were wearing heavy overcoats, long skirts. Um, there were no cars yet. So if you went outside, you really had to dress for the weather. So that that's where this um, high point comes. And then in the 1920s, it drops quite precipitously. Um, at this point, closed cars are starting to become available, heated street cars indoor heating, people just didn't need to wear quite as much as skirts had shortened. Um, it rises again around World War II. World wars are always um, times when a lot of wool is needed. And then it falls to about one and a half pounds in 1969, and it never really budged much from that point. This is a, um, oh, just a display showing from, from World War II. And it says it takes 10 sheep to clothe one soldier. And, you know, in World War II, uniforms are still made out of wool. Soldiers wear issued woolen blankets and so forth. So at this point, um, I might be passed in a right, typical book talk, I might be passing around swatches of different kinds of wool fabric so that you could see and, and um, feel the difference in them. And the best I can do right now is maybe some swatch charts from various mills. The woolen industry was quite different from the cotton industry in that um, what was made was more specialized. It started a little later because the in, Machinery was more, had to be more um, uh, it, 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 you could weave cotton on a very simple loom and it wouldn't break, but wool uh, machinery had to be a little more fine-tuned because the wool was more susceptible to breaking, especially since they were working with, with singles wool mostly. So um, the woolen industry started a little later. Mills would make a particular kind of fabric. They'd specialize, um, whether it was satinette, flannel, casimere, broadcloth, blankets, bunting, or worsted. And this is a mill in um, near Ware, Massachusetts, that was making flannels. I look at Massachusetts as the epicenter of the wool industry, both for where the machinery was developed and, and manufactured and for the sheer number of mills. In 1850, there were 134 mills out of 350 towns. 
And this map is from 1906. And um, again, the mills are still very dense. Um, every town that's named on this map has a mill in it. And some of them were cotton mills. These aren't all woolen mills, but quite a few of them were woolen or worsted mills. Some of the um, surprises along the way for me were um, finding out things like uh, just the amount of wool that was used in automobile upholstery. And this is a swatch of fabrics that showed up in 1935 automobiles, and they are all um, worsted fabrics. But um, and uh, in 1950, 51% of automobiles had woolen upholstery, but there was this very sudden shift so that by 1955, only 1% 1 of automobile upholstery was wool, and it was because of the synthetics that had come in. And so, for example, this is a 1951 automobile, and the fabric is craft weave, which is some combination of cotton and rayon, replacing the wool. So that brings me to what I'm seeing as kind of the pivot point in um, wool consumption in the United States. And I'm going to jump ahead to that and just read you a little bit there. The 1950s were the pivot point for the wool fibers commercial viability. In 1952, Alec Guinness starred in a British film, The Man in the White Suit, playing an inventor who dreams of creating an indestructible fabric that can't be torn, frayed, or stained an invention which would bring about the extinction of the textile industry. The inventor is up against a textile mill owner making traditional men's wool suiting. Although Guinness's character loses in the movie, history vindicates him. The movie speaks to the challenges of the post-war textile industry with man-made fibers and new fabrics replacing the old ones, wool in particular. The population of the US, 152 million in 1950, added an average of 25 million new bodies to be clothed each decade through 1980. Initially, there was a pent up demand for wool, which had largely been commandeered for military needs during the war. But in short order, wool was replaced by man-made fibers, wash and wear fabrics, and even new constructions such as double knits, all invented in the decade following the war. Domestic consumption of man-made fibers increased 73% from 1949 through 1969, with the result that per capita wool consumption was only 1.5 pounds by 1969. Innovation in traditional industrial textile technology ceased, textile production moved overseas, and American mills began to close. Crompton and Knowles, we're back to Crompton and Knowles finally, makers of virtually all wool and worsted looms used in the US dropped loom works from their name in 1954 and primarily sold parts for their looms rather than manufacturing whole machines. But I'm trying to get back to a hopeful point. At the same time, the 1950s saw the beginning of another hand weaving revival, this time with modern hand looms made by dozens of small companies. So even as the textile industry was closing, there was still um, a return to handcraft and um, there is a revival of hand weaving, there is a revival of hand knitting, um, hand spinning, and in another half century, the sheep and wolf fairs that we know, except for this year, um, are going strong. And I, I love this, um, this reminds me of a joke, something about, um, did you know it takes two sheep to make a sweater? And I didn't know sheep could knit. Anyway, this is Margot Apple's take on sheep knitting from one of her sheep books. And finally, um, something that I'm involved with right now that I feel is very hopeful too for the woolen and industry is the fiber shed movement. 
And that is the idea of making cloth from your own immediate area, whether it's sort of like a fiber shed, if you think of a watershed. Um, so a fiber shed would be within, you know, a certain geographical region around your, um, where you, you are, and you could have local clothes. And this is something that Western Mass is doing. So that's the end of my PowerPoint. And I'm back. Excellent. Thank you so yeah. much, Peggy. Peggy that was that's wonderful. so informative. Thank yeah. you very much. I have a question for you. How do you get that loom into your home or your shed or outbound? It looks like it weighs thousands of pounds. It does. It, it weighs a ton and a half. Mm -hmm. um, and literally um, 3,000 pounds? Yes. Yes. Wow. Yeah. wow. It does. And it's, um, I have. I had three, three large looms, 82 and 92 inch weaving widths. So, you know, they're, they're quite long and I have them in a barn mm -hmm. and where I am right now, because I found this barn with a solid concrete floor. Oh, wow. And, and we moved them with, um, the looms were on skids and we moved them one at a time with a tilt bed car carrier. So the car came, you know, it split it up onto the bed and then it dumped it back down. Oh that's, my that's, goodness. that's a whole longer story, but that's yes. okay. Peggy, yeah. if it's okay with you, I'd like to open up um, some discussions here this evening so that some of our viewers that are watching have an opportunity to ask you some questions as well. Do you have some time still? Sure, yeah. All right, that's great. Well, then let's enter into question and answer time. Um, so if anybody who is watching right now has any questions for Peggy, this would be a wonderful time to ask. Um, I have to say, one of the things that I love about these broadcasts that we do together is we have some general or generational sort of input differences. I've never even ridden in a car that had wool upholstery, upholstery inside. So <laughs> it's kind of interesting for me to see what a catalog may have looked like. And they said, and you have all these different options to choose really, from. Really? All those different fabrics? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's really okay. interesting to see. Well, I did because my family had an old car when I was little. And, I, you know, you do, I do remember that it was a little bit scratchy. Yeah. <laughs> So we have a question coming in actually from one of our guild members here in central Pennsylvania. Larry wants to know, what do you mean when you say that wool is the only natural fiber having an innate crimp? Oh gosh. <laughs> um, I, you know, it, it has, It has a crimp and it can be stretched out and and it will come back to that. Right. And I am not enough of a wool scientist to tell you anything more about yeah. than that. But if you compare it to like alpaca or mohair, yes, or you know, any of the cellulose fibers, none of them have Crimp, yeah. like. We often describe yeah. it to our students as the wool having memory to it, that once, yes. once it's been stretched out a little bit, you wash it and it tends to come back and it remembers the, the crimp placement. Yeah. Right. All right. right. We have some other questions. Actually, we have quite a few coming in here. Let's see. Um, yes. Yeah, somebody would like mm -hmm. to know, Judith asked if you could talk a bit more about the woodshed movement, I think. Fiber shed. Fiber shed. Okay. Fiber shed. Um, well, it started in California. And um, if you go online and type in fiber shed, you'll probably bring up the California okay. website. Okay. And they're like the mothership for all the small um, local fiber shed movements. Sure. Yeah. And uh, it started with the founder, Rebecca Burgess's um, quest to try to. Um, wear all locally made clothes for an entire year, only only locally made clothes for an entire year and, and what that would mean. And um, it's expanded to 
address um, farming techniques, okay. you know, different kinds of grazing techniques that are more um, carbon neutral. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But in in most cases, it just means the idea that you you will, uh, and it really goes back to like the 1800s. That's what's exciting to me about it, in that um, many of these small woolen mills in Massachusetts, they bought the wool locally, they they spun, they wove it, and then they sold it locally as well. Mm hmm. Absolutely. It was a booming industry. Yeah, before railroads, before, you know, it, it, it was all very much local demand. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Lorraine uh, has a question. How long does it take you to dress or prepare for weaving on one of your looms? So you were describing, I'm sorry, was it 80 inches and 90 inches? What are the two widths that you right. said you had? Mm -hmm. How long right. does it take to, for you to dress that loom? And maybe a better question would be, what's the set that you're working at <laughs> with those widths? Yeah. <laughs> well, so I'm I'm working with relatively coarser wool, so mm -hmm. you know I'm working from anywhere from eleven to fourteen ends per inch. Okay, yeah. And a lot of the times I'm working with singles, one run wool. Okay. And, okay. Which is sixteen hundred yards per pound, okay. and it takes me about twelve hours to set up a a warp. Okay. Um, the my warping machinery is my favorite machinery. Actually, yeah. I have this warping reel it's it's a um, horizontal warping reel yeah and I, I can wind you know 400 yards on it yeah and then once it's wound onto the beam then uh wound onto the warping reel then i transfer to warping beam and i put the beam in the loom and then i thread the loom just as any hand weaver would okay. um i'm threading it from back to front wow so Amazing. I have to I have to ask: Is that sort of an average length warp for you then, four hundred yards long? No, okay. no. My minimum. I I do a lot of commission weaving for sheep farmers. Yeah. And my minimum warp is forty yards. Okay. And so that that's more typical. Okay. Um, I happen to be making a weaving a four a two hundred yard warp right now. Sure. Yeah. But yeah, it just depends on what. The person what the demand for. is sure yeah sure okay do we have any more questions out here in the audience or have you heard, thought of anything else you want to well i have peggy uh in over the years i've had a number of friends who've restored cars and this whole mm -hmm. idea of the upholstery really is intriguing mm -hmm. i can hardly wait to sit down over a glass of wine and tell them about this if they're <laughs> in the midst of restoring a car can they contact an individual like you to custom weave that upholstery for that uh, that vintage old model A Ford, or they, yeah, there's a couple companies out there that have you know stock um, mm -hmm. fabric ready to go, but I've been contacted by any number of car people, um, you know anything from Rolls Royces to yeah. Fords, yeah. 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 All right, we just got a fun one. <laughs> Linda Hammond is intrigued about the urine discussion. Anybody who's ever talked about <laughs> natural dyeing is always interested in the urine discussion. And I've heard not only the folks right outside the taverns, but um, pregnant women. We've heard that those are good sources for, for urine as well. Um, and yeah. if you want to expand upon that, please. <laughs> All I know is what I read in you know, that uh, whatever, I, I'm not remembering the source of the book yeah. or sort of that quote that that came from, but um, yeah, it was good for uh, getting the grease out of the wool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. The, the urea that really is found in it, I think the pub was a logical place because they're consuming a lot of liquids, therefore right. they're, they're dispensing sure. a lot of liquids. But and, also, yeah. high levels of protein is, is yeah. crucial as well. Mm -hmm. Actually, you know what? I actually, Linda, and talked to a <laughs> urologist about this one time. And he said, you know what? You drink a lot of beer, you're going to get a lot of urine. Yeah. It's really a win-win situation for, for the drinker as well as the person who's doing either the dyeing or the processing right. of this wool. But they're really looking for the ammonia. And so <laughs> if you ferment the urine, you get ammonia out of it. 
Mm -hmm. So I am so glad you put that in the book because yeah. when I bring that up to especially to middle schoolers, you, you get the giggles and the laughs and they think it's hysterical, <laughs> but it's part of our history. And I'm so glad you included that in the book. <laughs> well, fun. you know, I, it was so much fun to research. And, and I must say, this is over like, I don't know, eight or nine years. It, yeah. it didn't, um, I didn't set out to write a book. I started out to, um, put together some talks for Weaver's Guilds about, um, I started with the history of the company that made my looms and then I went forward in time to um, uh, the industry, the, the wool industry, and then I went backward in time. And, and then, you know, I realized I s had a number of chapters stacking up and that yeah. this could this could be a book, but along the way, I've spent a lot of time in in museums and archives, and it was so much fun finding all these interesting details and also the image images. And yeah. um, Schiffer published this book, and I love them because they, you know, after they accepted the idea of the book, they said, "Well, how many images do you want to put in it?" and and I said, well, how many may I? Because <laughs> I don't know if you've looked at many um, historical um, publishers lately, but there's there's often no images. And and the whole what was so fun and for people that aren't riveted by historical <laughs> overviews, you know, what keeps them going, I think, is is the images. And I did. Yeah. you know, find so many great well, ones. Everyone's yeah. clearly was triggered by the picture of your loom at home because it's so very different yeah. from the looms that all of us have here. Um, in mm -hmm. fact, Brenda, she's chiming in and she wants to know, is it automatic? Please explain to the viewers who have never used a fly shuttle, how do you actually weave on one of these looms? It's not like just pushing a button and letting it go. Right. Yeah. yeah. Can you describe that process a little bit for her? So if you're going from a hand loom to my loom, there's actually a number of steps along the way. Mm -hmm. And the first step would have been just to have a hand loom with a fly shuttle. Sure. And in that case, you know, you're operating the, the, uh -huh. the shuttle back and forth. Um, and then once, once loom started to be mechanized and it was first with water power, um, but the idea was the same, you know, you had a flywheel on the loom and that was what was powering all the things that needed powering. Yeah. Um, if you think about what you do as a hand weaver, you, um, you raise the harnesses to make a shed, you throw the shuttle, you, you bring the beater down, you, um, have to advance every so often. And all of those things are, had to be mechanized on power looms, which is why it, it wasn't um, immediate that, that weaving was mechanized. Me weaving was the last part of the process to be mechanized because there are so many sure. steps in the way that had to be incorporated into, into a loom design. So, um, the patterning itself, which is maybe what Brenda's asking about. Mm -hmm. So there are hand looms that have dobby heads, like the AVL looms. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes, um, it, well, well, in the olden days, you know, like in the 1960s, they had, um, they had pattern chains that you physically had to create, you know, uh -huh. and yeah. each each bar of the chain is one pick of the one pick in the pattern. And you had to actually put these little pegs in mm -hmm. for, to tell which harness is to go up and down. They always remind me to be like the equivalent to a Weaver's player piano. Those drums right. you stick mm -hmm. in and it plays out the tune. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, the, so Dobby heads, were initially put on hand looms and then eventually they got applied to power looms. Okay, yeah. 
Yeah, and of course today the AVL looms are computer mm -hmm. driven, but yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it's a totally mechanical thing where um, these little pegs or in my case, I have these metal chains, um, but the peg or the the peg has to intersect with something that will push it yeah. that will then cause the harness to raise. Yes. Yeah. If that makes sense. It does. Yeah. Thank you yeah. very much. Thank you. Okay. Oh, yeah. Ellen, Ellen's chiming in. She said she used those chains in the 1980s still. <laughs> yeah. 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 They're wonderful. You can keep leaving when the lights are off, right? <laughs> right. And Linda said she absolutely appreciates all the extra images because that makes the history come alive for yeah. her, which is yeah. totally true. Yeah. Well, if nobody, it doesn't seem like any more questions are coming in right now, but um, we truly wanted to thank you for being here with us. We've had a wonderful time sort of getting to know you and getting to know a little bit about what went into writing this book. Thank you so much, yeah. Maggie. Yeah, thank you this, so much. This has just been wonderful. On behalf of our whole fiber arts community, yeah. Yeah. Now, as we um, sort of close here this evening, there's a couple things that I just wanted to um, sort of go over with everybody before we um, continue on with the book club. Now, um, we will continue to meet here every single week on Wednesday mm -hmm. evenings, 8 o'clock on the Eastern Coast. Um, if you need a copy of the schedule, um, please know that there's a couple places you can find the schedule. Certainly the events will be listed here every week. Um, and so when we are, um, you know, wrapping up, um, we'll also sort of have up here on the, the screen for you. We can pause the video or you can pause the video from your end and write down all these dates. But um, if you navigate yourself to our website, under our blog section where I posted um, the book club announcement, we also have this recorded there as well. So number of places that you can look for these. Um, as we wrap up, of course, next week, October 21st, we're going to be introducing the colonial period, which is the first full chapter of the book. And so, like last time, we're going to be pulling some additional content together, things that spark our interest. I know one thing we have on the docket. I was, I was so thrilled when we first started talking about introducing this book. And I'm flipping through the, um, uh, the intro section right now because it's worth noting. I, I sort of was um, bounding into the room and I said, hey, hey, Dad, you've got to see this section of the book. Um, it's so interesting. There's an author featured here named Lewis Miller, and I showed him a copy of the picture that was featured in the book. Um, it's a wonderful illustration of everyday life, but what caught my eye on this particular image is that it was noted that it was taken from the York County Heritage Trust, which, of course, that's the county that we're here. In our backyard. Backyard. Yeah. And Dad gets this huge cheeky grin on his face. He said, I have Lewis's Miller book right at my house. So we're going to be sharing a little bit of that next, next week as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, like normal, please continue to comment in our comment section because once we close, um, people are still going to ask questions. People are going to still keep adding content to the conversation. So if somebody responded to a question that you have, you might get a response even beyond this evening. Yeah. Anything else you want to add? No, but tonight? I'm just glad we're back in the saddle and doing this again. Us too. Yeah. We really we really do enjoy this. And although we're sort of back to sort of normal with classes here yeah. in the Glen, um, I, I look forward to this every Wednesday evening. Um, so until we see each other next week, I hope you all stay well and healthy. Keep weaving, keep, keep knitting, weaving, keep work weaving. with wool. Yes. All right. Thank you, guys, and Take have care. a great evening.